fascinating. I'm delighted that we're joined by Professor Chris Summerfield, uh, who's a professor of cognitive neuroscience here in the University of Oxford uh, in the Department of Experimental Psychology. He's also a senior research fellow uh, at Wadham College. Uh, Chris is interested in the neural and computational mechanisms that underlie perception and cognition. And, and as well as his work here in Oxford, he works with the leading British artificial intelligence company, uh, Deep Mind, um, who I think holds some sort of record for the number of articles they've had placed in nature uh, in a given period. But I think without any further ado, I'll now ask Chris uh, to embark on his talk, which I think is entitled Artificial Intelligence, Artificial Benevolence. Chris. Fantastic. Thank you, Ken, and thank you, Julie, and welcome to you all. Um, so it's a real pleasure to see um, not just so many people, but also to see some, I think, current and uh, recently graduated students of experimental psychology from Wadham. So that's particularly nice. Welcome. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. So this is the technological part. So we may solve um, problems in artificial intelligence before we solve problems in audiovisual control. So it might not all go to plan, but let's just uh, check. Um, okay, so I think... Um, that should work. And I hope you can all see my screen and my title. Is that right? Can someone nod? Yes. Thank you, Julie. Okay. Fantastic. So yes, as Ken said, um, this is my title. Um, I'm aiming to speak for approximately 15 to 20 minutes to leave lots of room for questions. Um, so Ken, maybe you could just try and shut me up after sort of 20 minutes if I go on too long. That would be good. I, I wouldn't dream of it, Chris. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I just want to start, this is a, this is a talk about uh, technology, but I just want to start by putting what I'm going to say in a global context. And I think, you know, it's really important to acknowledge as, and it will be relevant for my talk later on to acknowledge that we are, you know, we live in very turbulent times. Um, we are politically divided. Um, we are threatened by really substantial, you know, global crises such as climate change. I mean, of course, 20% of the world's population is currently under some sort of lockdown due to uh, COVID-19. And, you know, I'm going to talk about technology, but I think it's really important to acknowledge that the technology that is being built is being built in this context. Um, secondly, the other thing that I think is really, really crucial for all to acknowledge for all of us is the extent to which um, our social, political and economic processes are mediated by technology these days. So I'm sure I don't need to tell you there are 2 billion people on Facebook. There are half a billion tweets on Twitter uh, sent every single day. Uh, there are, there are um, a billion hours of YouTube videos consumed every single day. Um, so the extent to which we are connected in a global network, um, to the extent to which we are, to quote um, um, from a recent book, hyper-socialized, and the extent to which all of our interactions are facilitated by new technology um, is, um, is really quite remarkable. And this is the backdrop to um, the, the talk that I'm going to give, which is specifically about artificial intelligence. So, um, amongst all of these changes, there has been an explosion of um, uh, commercial entities that are seeking to build artificial intelligence and indeed to try and build what I will describe later in my talk as, as uh, systems with general intelligence. So here's a few of them. Um, you may be familiar with some of these, these names and as Ken said, I should give a disclaimer. So I'm involved with one of them. So uh, DeepMind down there on the bottom left. Uh, on my screen at least, is um, I'm a research scientist there, I spend half of my time there. You'll be familiar with many of the, the many of these are household names, IBM, Apple, Facebook, um, some of them you may be uh, less familiar with, but this is just a small cross-section of the companies that are really involved in, in building AI um, at the moment. And substantial progress has been made, I think it's fair to say, over recent years. And I just want to highlight, you know, some, some recent um, successes. I'll start by talking about some from DeepMind, uh, which is partly partisan, but I think partly because, as Ken said, uh, much of the um, kind of groundbreaking work has been done there. So DeepMind um, has done a lot of pioneering work in training artificial agents to play games. And they started with a relatively simple uh, computer games, such as those that um, I played when I was, I'm a child of the 1970s and 80s, so I, games that I played when I was a kid, um, such as Space Invaders. Um, and um, moving on from there, they, so we can think of those as kind of 
Um, they're, they're relatively simple games, although they have reasonably complex inputs. So the inputs of the, the pixels on the screen that the agent is seeing and deciding how to, to behave. Um, from there, they went on to, to kind of to flip, flip that, the problem on its head and to take games that had simple inputs but were incredibly complicated themselves. So games like Go, as well as uh, Chess and, and Shogi. And as I'm sure all of you know, um, you know, one of the landmark achievements uh, of the last five years has been uh, the development of an artificial system that can beat um, the, the world grandmaster at uh, the game of Go. Um, and, and most recently, what we've had is kind of a fusion of those two. So now we have systems that can play uh, with complex inputs, play complex games that themselves have complex inputs. And I just want to give you a flavor of what that looks like. So this is a video which shows actually two artificial agents playing against one another. This is again built by DeepMind and they're playing the game StarCraft, which is a, a global eSport. So it's a fiendishly complex strategy game that involves, you know, kind of whole kind of political economies that are required you need to organize a political, political economy in order to build troops. Um, and then you need to coordinate those troops in all sorts of complex ways in order to, to win territory and defeat your enemies. Um, and although um, uh, AI systems can't yet um, beat, beat the world's very, very top players at this game. They can do exceedingly well and they're in the major leagues, um, which is really quite an achievement, I think. But it's actually a different technology and a different advance, which has really captured people's attention recently. And that's not come from DeepMind. It's come from a different company, which is known as OpenAI, which is based in San Francisco. And OpenAI, instead of focusing on games, they focused on natural language. Now, natural language is obviously a grand challenge for artificial intelligence. Um, and the ability to produce systems that can speak in the languages, in the, the languages that we as humans as use, we, we as humans use, including but not limited to English, um, is of course, um, uh, provides an opportunity. It opens doors to, you know, absolute, an absolute uh, world of new um, opportunities. So what I'm showing you here on the screen here is a, um, it's the example, it's an example output from an, uh, an artificial agent, which was built by um, OpenAI. It's called GPT-3. You may have heard about it. And what GPT-3 does is it produces natural language, which is plausible in response to queries, which are, um, again, made in natural language. So here, what it was faced with was it was given the title of um, um, a news article, the title and subtitle, which is the title was United Methodists Agree to Historic Split. And the subtitle was, those who oppose gay marriage will form their own denomination. So this is a wholly fictional scenario. Um, and um, what it is, is what the, the agent is being asked to do is to generate text that might plausibly follow from the title and subtitle of a news article, um, that, that, that title and subtitle of a news article. And you can see, um, I, mean, I won't read it out here, but what is written what the, what the agent came up with is not only syntactically coherent, it not, the sentences not only obeys the, obey basic laws of English, um, English grammar, but it's, it's semantically coherent and it's semantically coherent over the long scale, over the, over, the, over the long term. So the whole article is structured just like a news article. And when I say that this news article is kind of human-like, that's backed up by data because when they asked uh, humans to judge uh, whether there were real, whether articles were generated by real journalists or by uh, this artificial agent, um, for the largest possible um, uh, systems, the systems that, that were the biggest and had the greatest number of, of, of uh, trainable parameters, the, um, the news articles were indistinguishable. So <clears throat> um, I think that's really, really quite uh, remarkable, but I want to show you something else which I think is really quite astonishing and shows the power of what these agents can do. So this is where the, tra the, the, art the agent, again, GPT-3, is being asked not to generate natural language, but to generate HTML text. So it's be essentially being asked to translate from words in English to HTML text. And so what the um, example is doing, so in that box there, the, um, a, a human user is typing something like, can I please have a button for every color of the rainbow? The computer thinks that the agent thinks about it for a while, and then it just generates it. And so you can imagine how this might revolutionize all kinds of domains of endeavor, not just, you know, kind of web design, um, but, um, you know, you can think of applications in things like education, um, way, way beyond. It gets this one wrong, actually, but, uh, but it's very close. Um, so um, I think that's quite, that's really um, quite remarkable. So I want to just talk about 
this, this as, a, as a context for thinking about, you know, where, where are we going with this? So what, what is happening? What's going to happen next? And that's really what I want to just introduce you to. So I'm going to start by talking about the, the mission statements. And I'm going to choose these two companies that I think have, you know, really contributed these landmark changes over the recent years. So if we think about what they say they're going to do. So DeepMind says it wants to build advanced AI or artificial general intelligence, we'll talk about that in a second, to expand our knowledge and find um, new answers. And <clears throat> by solving this, we think we could help people solve thousands of problems. OpenAI say something very similar. They say their mission is to ensure that artificial general intelligence is, um, is beneficial for all of humanity. So I just want to unpick what they mean by that and talk a little bit about what that, what that means for us. So first of all, both statements talk about this notion of artificial general intelligence. So what do we mean by that? Well, there are lots of definitions of what we might mean by artificial and general intelligence, but usually when people talk about this, they, they use the term to refer to the ability to build agents that are human-like in their capacities, that can match or exceed typical human abilities in a roughly human-like environment. That's a definition uh, from a prominent AI researcher. Secondly, um, highlighted here in orange, you know, both companies, I think, are explicit in the fact that they're not building general intelligence for its own sake. They're building general intelligence in order to try and help humanity, in order to try and solve the world's problems, help people solve thousands of problems or benefit all of humanity. So that's explicit in their, uh, the mission statement. So, so what does that actually mean? And what's actually going to happen? Well, I think, you know, effectively, what, what we're really claiming here is that the goal of that by building AI, we can in some way help solve those problems that I began by introducing. We can begin by, you know, we can, we can use AI to, to um, heal political divisions, to solve, you know, in potentially insurmountable problems such as uh, otherwise insurmountable problems such as climate change and so on. And of course, you know, AI has already been deployed to try and, you know, kind of um, uh, do, do data modeling for COVID. So it's already being applied to that, that domain here. But I just want to, to think a little bit about what this claim means. And I think, you know, if you think about, we've already seen the artificial general intelligence, by that we mean human-like intelligence. And when we say the world's problems, of course, really we mean humanity's problems. So another way of thinking about this claim is that what we're saying is that we, by building a human-like intelligence, we can help solve humanity's problems. And I think that in a way that sort of jars with how we actually conduct our research in AI today. And that goes for all of the companies that, that, that I've talked about. So really, you know, AI research today is framed by um, the tools of machine learning. And what, mach what happens in machine learning is that agents, neuro typically neural networks, are trained to um, behave for themselves essentially from what's typically known as big data. So that's um, large scale data sets um, containing information about you know, something in the world. And you, know, you can use that, for example, this is another example from DeepMind. So you can use, wait for the big data is something like you know, kind of um, uh, videos or, in, or envir game environments that contain rewards, and here are apples, right? Then we can use that to train agents to do really clever stuff like forage for them, like a biological animal might do. But I think it's really salient that when, when we do this and think again about the StarCraft example, you know, if what we're trying to do is we're trying to solve human problems for humans, where are the humans in this process? They're missing from this process. And I think that's important. Um, at this stage, I want to take the opportunity to, to highlight that, you know, what the, the argument that I'm making is not my own. In fact, um, it's an argument which has been made by many people. and I think it's been made best, in fact, by remarkably by an honorary fellow of Wadham, alumnus and honorary fellow of Wadham by the name of Stuart Russell, who wrote what I think is one of the most significant books in AI um, to come out in the last few years. It's called Human Compatible. And in this, he argues that our AI technologies need to be compatible with humans and human society, meaning that their values they need to, the, the, the values that the agents learn, that they acquire, need to be aligned with ours so that we can build systems that are safe and that are fair and that are accountable to us. Um, and, you know, many of you may have seen this in the last few days, but this just popped up a couple of days ago, so I couldn't resist um, highlighting it if you didn't see it. So, you know, Twitter and other social media use artificial intelligence and they use it in all sorts of ways to curate the information and determine what to show you. But they also use it for something as simple as deciding how to crop an image to show um, on your Twitter uh, feed. 
And so um, researchers have noticed that you know, if you present it with an image like the one on the left here, which is a bit outsized and doesn't quite fit on your standard Twitter feed, but it has on it two different images, um, uh, face images, and Twitter has to decide which of those two images to show, um, then it makes a decision which, um, you know, it has to choose one of them. And here, you know, it happened to choose the white face, not the black face. Um, now, of course, you might say, well, obviously, you know, the, the white face was at the top, so maybe it's just using that. Um, so we can control for that. We can put the black face at the top instead. And lo and behold, it chooses the white face again, right? So, you know, this is a classic example, a quotidian example to which we have all been exposed if we use Twitter of how machine learning can be used in ways which are not fair and are not accountable, at least to everyone. I mean, this is not technically unsafe, although should, uh, I was going to make a joke about Mitch McConnell there, but maybe I won't in the interests of uh, the diversity in the audience. Anyway, so Russell says, intelligence without knowledge is like an engine without fuel. And humans acquire vast amount of knowledge from other, other humans. And I couldn't agree more. And I think this means that in thinking about how to build AI, we need to go further. And in fact, I would argue that, you know, we need to go beyond this paradigm and we need to go to a new paradigm that takes much greater account of how humans acquire their intelligence in the first place. And actually, if you think about where humans acquire their intelligence from, um, it's quite remarkable. So this here I've got, this is, this is made up by me. It's not definitive in any way, but it's a sort of what I call a technology timeline. It's a, it's a list of things that, you know, we have evolved, including things we evolved um, uh, culturally and, you know, I've earmarked those that are unique to humans versus those that we share with other species. But it's also remarkable that if you think about all of the achievements in the blue box here, how many of them did we get by trial and error learning, like that, that, like that agent that's moving around in the environment foraging for apples that I just showed you? And how much did we get from other people? Well, actually, almost all of the thing that really matters to us are the things that we would characterize as being part of a, a you know, a, a, an intelligent human as having, they come through either overt cultural transmission, that means teaching by other humans, or implicit cultural transmission, that means imitating other humans. In other words, human intelligence is about other humans. Human intelligence is stuff that we've learned from other humans. So if we want our agents to be um, aligned to our values and preferences, we need to take that into account. So in other words, I think we need to put our humans inside the training loop. Um, we need to, when we train our agents, they need to be trained directly in interaction with humans so that they can learn about our values and our preferences. And I think this is a really critical feature of how AI uh, research should progress into the future. And I would even go so far as to say, you know, we talked about general intelligence and the definition of general intelligence was something that can perform lots and lots of tasks like a human can. But I would go further and I would say that actually the difference between narrow and general intelligence is that narrow intelligence systems are those that can perform tasks that are set for it by humans, like please play go really well. And general intelligence is a system that can choose which tasks to perform in order to maximize benefit for humans and human society. And that's what I mean by artificial benevolence in my title. Um, so, you know, circling back, I began here with thinking about, you know, all the challenges that face us. And I hope that the technologies that we build um, using this, this approach can be better deployed to, to try and assuage them. Thank you all very much for listening.